your jet has just started that. So welcome, I'm Ron Delphine. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at the Heinz College. And uh, in this four alumni by alumni session, we are excited to welcome back Eugene Leventhal, who's a 2019 alum from our PPM program to discuss cryptocurrency. Eugene will give a basic overview on the origins and importance of Bitcoin, what made it innovative, and why people should generally be, be paying attention to decentralization and governance. A little bit about Eugene, he's currently the operations lead at the Smart Contract Research Forum, where he leads operational planning, outreach efforts, and hiring, and is working on a forthcoming video podcast. Prior to that, he was here at Carnegie Mellon, where he worked with Scilab, as well as here at the Heinz College. Eugene also spent seven years in professional services for global financial institutions. In addition to his degree from Heinz, he also has a BS in finance and psychology from NYU Stern School of Business. And with that, I will turn it over to Eugene. Perfect, thank you, Ron. And so, yeah, as mentioned, the topic that I was thinking of covering today was kind of zooming out to talk about some of the innovations that led to Bitcoin, why was Bitcoin itself innovative and what are kind of, at least from my perspective, what are some of the most interesting elements of Bitcoin and its evolution and kind of where the cryptocurrency world has been headed at a very high level and to kind of zoom in on the importance of governance in specific. So that's kind of the agenda that I have in mind. Again, I am very open-minded to adjusting depending on what people are thinking about uh, and what they'd want to get into. So yeah, definitely uh, really happy to, uh, to play around with different ideas there. Uh, and if you do have any questions, concerns, anything at all as we're going, just please feel free to actually drop questions in the chat. Uh, I do definitely want to make this much more excuse me, of an interactive session as opposed to just me monologuing. Uh, I, yeah, it, it's always much more exciting for me to have a conversation and just looking at the initial poll responses really quickly. And thank you for those who filled those out. It looks as though, uh, yeah, there, there is a, at least half the folks who filled it out are more in the what's a blockchain rather than being deeper into the knowledge. Uh, I guess not surprisingly, Satoshi Nakamoto is not with us today. Uh, but uh, on the other side, in terms of what folks want to learn most, it's actually kind of a, a bit of a mix between just being able to have a conversation about the topic, as well as really understanding, is this topic a fad or not? So yeah, again, I'm going to get started with my spiel of some of the history aspects and why I think this is exciting and interesting. And please feel free to cut me off via chat, uh, or even if you want, potentially want to jump in on audio, please feel free. So yeah, so in general, I like to think of, I remember when I first got into the blockchain cryptocurrency space and, and went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole in early 2016, that when I was reading about this, it really seemed as though this brand new thing was magic digital money that's going to solve all the world's problems and somehow came out of nowhere. And the more I actually started getting into it and peeling back some of the layers, I realized that that was very much a misconception. And that was just due to my own lack of knowledge of industries uh, like cloud computing, uh, around the nuances of cryptography, around the nuances in previous attempts at digital money, uh, because the first attempt at digital money, I don't know if anyone here uh, remembers or played around with DigiGold back in the, the late 80s, uh, but I think that idea started coming together around 82, 83. Uh, so the ideas of digital money are not new, uh, and the ideas of distributed computing and the whole idea of how do you decentralize an information architecture, that itself was not new, but for someone like myself who uh, I did not have my Heinz degree yet and had not done any information systems courses, I, I wasn't that aware of the, the real history there. And so it seemed like blockchain cryptocurrency was, uh, especially by 2017 with the last, uh, or I guess the first of the massive market runs uh, when Bitcoin first ran up to 20K-ish, um, it just seemed like it was this magic internet money that dropped out of nowhere. But the more I got into it, the more I like to think of it in terms of three different areas, uh, in terms of advancements for information or databases or information architecture, however you want to put that, advances of money and uh, what does it mean to actually share a store of value. And the other side is cryptography. And 
Of course, there's more nuances than that. Each one of those three topics can get its own hour long lecture and still barely scratch the surface. But in a nutshell, from the information perspective, you know, since we kind of started shifting to more digital uh, information architectures post World War II, especially, you know, it didn't take long, especially in the context of the Cold War, to come up with the idea of, hey, if we have all of our information stored in a single place, what if that place gets bombed and then we lose all that information? And so a lot of the initial research into distributed computing, mesh networks and the like really came from the military from a resiliency perspective around how do we just maintain our information flow as a, a knowledge base. I think it was mainly oriented towards scientific research at the time, though that part I'm not 100% sure on. Um, but still, how do we just maintain resiliency in that kind of information system? And uh, distributed computing, which was sort of the resulting school of, uh, uh, of technology that came out of that specific substrate, uh, that's been evolving. I mean, there's for anyone who's deeper into that, uh, or if anyone here finished the IS, uh, the, the MISM program and has had the distributed uh, computing course with Mike McCarthy or anything else along those lines. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of algorithms like Paxos and Raft, but in a nutshell, Right, the whole idea with the database is you need to store information on a specific topic in a specific place. And there's always the question of, well, who gets to add more information to that store? Who gets to be the, uh, the person contributing to our overall base of knowledge? And who gets to decide who gets to add and, and uh, who potentially can get kicked out of it? Right, so that's more of who are the contributors and who are the admins uh, or who are the users and the admins in traditional database settings. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was just someone accidentally off mute or if someone had a question. Yeah, so, and again, please do feel free to, to just drop questions in, in chat or, or jump in if anything. But the whole idea there was to, uh, you know, again, how do you actually figure out who gets to contribute to the information and who gets the gatekeeping rights over it? And with the distributed computing, if you're really interested in that topic and want to look at the evolution of that world, uh, you know, you'll see it comes back down to the question of once you step away from actually knowing all of the people who are going to be contributing to your database, how do you decide who gets to add a transaction next? Right. If Ron and I are both kind of administering uh, an open database, and I add a I, I add a I add a, a record, and Ron adds a record at the same time, how do you know kind of which one of those uh, might be the 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 right one to listen to or to add more information to? And so, the idea of uh, what is the, the, the kind of information interaction there is really important. And with Bitcoin, one of the major innovations and with proof of work, and we can delve into that if there are any, uh, if people want to learn a little more about that. But in short, proof of work is this competition that is mathematically driven where people are just kind of doing a set computation. It's not as though it's a different thing each time you run the same exact computational process over and over again to see if you get a certain amount of leading zeros in your output. And once you have enough leading zeros, you're like, oh, hey, I just won the race. And winning that race for a miner and uh, the people who do the proof of work are the miners, winning the race means I get a chance to be the one to add uh, my proposed set of transactions to the history of this money database. Um, so I guess to, to take a quick pause, I see there was a question of how do Block, how does blockchain work with non-static relational databases? Uh, I would need a little more information on the color that you're thinking of there, Robert. Uh, in general, I would oversimplify an answer that blockchains are a type of data structure, a type of database. Uh, they're a very inefficient one at that. And that is a very important thing to say for public blockchains uh, to expose my own ideology. I am a very big proponent of public blockchains are blockchains. Private blockchains are new advances in distributed computing and distributed databases. Uh, I don't personally see things like Hyperledger uh, and Fabric and like those projects that they're creating. I don't personally view them as blockchains because for me, a blockchain needs to be open and public and anyone needs to be able to contribute information to it. And at least in theory, anyone should be able to be the, the equivalent of the admins or the, the ones who are getting to actually add transactions as well. So that's just a minor uh, caveat with how I look at it. So I think it really depends in terms of what you mean with how do blockchains work with traditional databases. So it really depends on the product that you're building. But if you're building a product that you have some kind of layer of information that it's okay for that to 
scale slower, but you need to create it as a baseline of trust. And then you have massive data sets beyond that. You might want to create an architecture where potentially via smart contracts or via other tools, you will find a way to have um, your blockchain interacting with different style databases. But all of this is still really new and there are not good models that are tried and tested. And, you know, like here's the off the shelf how you uh, get a blockchain to be part of your general tech stack, because I think there still is a, a huge open question of where are blockchains truly useful. And I do, especially if you follow the headlines of the last five-ish years, uh, there's a lot of promises of what blockchains will solve. I don't believe in a, a bunch of those. I, I think a lot of that is just blowing smoke and, and snake oil salespeople. Um, but nonetheless, you can have blockchains interacting with other, uh, other types of databases if that's what makes sense for your, uh, your technical architecture. So another question coming, can you touch on the distinction between proof of work and proof of stake? Yes, I will, I will make sure to get on that, but uh, in a little bit, because I just want to give some more background context really quickly. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, again, proof of work is the whole idea of there's people competing on a random math problem. It's computational based. It's not as though there's literally someone trying to like, you know, more quickly solve a math equation than someone else. It's a computation of, hey, we have the same inputs, all of the transactions that are waiting to be confirmed. Uh, we have a random number called the nonce in these systems, and we run it through a thing called a hash function, which produces an output, and we want the output to look a certain way. And you keep running it until your output looks that certain way. And so that's the whole idea of mining is who, who is going to say that, hey, I solved this first. And then the whole uh, everyone else mining quickly double checks it, or at least should in theory. And then we start running the race again. And this race in Bitcoin happens roughly every 10 minutes. And the logic of that is both to solve the who gets to add new transactions to the database problem, because in this case, it's whoever won the race, you are now the admin for this one round and you get to propose uh, a set of trans oh, to have been racing, uh, to have been in the race in the first place. That means you already proposed your set of transactions. Um, and so uh, if you win that race, you get a coin base, which is actually where the trading company or the exchange got its name. But a coin based transaction is what you get in Bitcoin for being the person or, or entity that solved that problem every 10 minutes. So when Bitcoin was originally launched, I think it was January 3rd, 2009 was the first official transaction. Uh, for, every, uh, for every 10 minutes, for every block that was added to the chain, for every time someone solved that problem and they were told like, yes, your, your thing is the, the new state of truth and now we're all running the race again on the block you just added, uh, they would get 50 Bitcoin, uh, five zero. That number gets cut in half uh, every four years at this point. So I think we're at 12 and a half right now. I think that was where the last halfening hit us. Uh, my apologies if we're at 675 and I'm just forgetting uh, my last halfening event. But yeah, I do believe about a year or two ago in the summer, we cut down again. And I think in it's roughly every four years. It's by the amount of blocks, which turns out to be roughly every four years. Um, so. In, in terms of, yeah, so to take a step back, because I realize those are some more nuanced questions. So to zoom out again, right, one of the advancements of Bitcoin when it first came out was the idea of, in terms of creating an information architecture where you can have anyone in the world contribute to it, anyone in the world get to interact with it and oversee it, uh, the, the main they made there was actually finding a way to solve the problem of how can people contribute to this kind of database. In traditional distributed databases, you still need to effectively call a group of people admins in some kind of capacity. You need to have a known set of contributors. So that was one of the elements of what Bitcoin innovated was in terms of the idea of how do people introduce uh, information into uh, any kind of system, whether it's linked to money or not. Uh, and yeah, I see uh, two comments came in of, of kind of keeping it at the novice level. So yeah, I mean, especially with these higher level, the background context, I'm trying to uh, to keep it limited from being overly advanced. I, just the challenge with these sessions is there's always people at various levels of knowledge. So I will do my best to kind of touch on uh, touch on both sides uh, without going too 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 deep into the nitty gritty. But I feel like in general, with any of this 
with anything with blockchain and cryptocurrencies, given how many industries it's building on top of, uh, there's just this inevitable feeling of, uh, yeah, there, there, there's just an overwhelming amount of new information. So I will do my best to, to not throw out too many things. But uh, again, just seeing the, the questions that come up, we'll do my best to kind of manage without going too deep and uh, without, um, yeah, while also adding some more of the introductory elements. So again, to zoom back, the three main advances in my mind leading up to Bitcoin and why Bitcoin was so interesting were the advances in terms of just how you store information, right? Just database type structures uh, in a distributed environment specifically. So how do you get a group of people to coordinate and agree on a digital state of truth about something uh, and to have that be something uh, that is procedurally driven, not just like 10 of us know each other and so we trust each other or something like that. So the information side was one aspect. The other side is digital money. And the whole idea of, you know, if you look at the history of money, I know the book, uh, what is it? Uh, Debt, a hi Debt, a history of 5,000 years or something to that effect has been a very popular book in, in recent years. But if you look at money from basic kind of uh, stone or coinage or whatever came up to facilitate barter and exchange and trade, when that ended uh, advancing to, you know, there's a frequent question that comes up of like, oh, what's a Bitcoin worth? How do I know what a Bitcoin is actually worth or should be worth? And then if you follow up with the same question of, well, how do you know what a dollar should be worth? Some people still think it's pegged to, you know, their assets. So some people think dollars are still asset backed and they're not, they stopped being, oh, stop being gold backed in the early seventies. And so these things do just come down to market faith, market belief, uh, and these kind of more ephemeral uh, ideas. And so with Bitcoin, part of the ideological impetus for creating Bitcoin was how do we create a money system that is not controlled by centralized parties who are prone to corruption, who are prone to wanting to do things their way, I mean, right, you, there's no shortage of looking through the history of any region of the world, uh, and there's no shortage of corrupt examples of corruption and people manipulating markets to their own advantage. So the beautiful ideological vision is, oh, well, if we can create an international money system that is outside of the purview of central banks, of corporations, etc., then we actually have this big argument, right? I still see Bitcoin as a bit of a massive social, very expensive social experiment. Um, but what happens when we create one of these systems out of nowhere, right? 10 years ago would have been what, October 2000, 2001-ish? Uh, uh, that would have been, so October 31st is actually the anniversary of the Bitcoin white paper. So we're, we're almost having this session at the anniversary, 2008, uh, October 31st is when the Bitcoin white paper first came out. And that timing is not coincidental, right? Right at the start of the financial crisis, the first transaction ever with Bitcoin, because uh, you could just include kind of plain text with the transactions that you submit. So the first ever transaction in Bitcoin had uh, that day's, um, forgetting is it the Daily Mail, it was one of the very large British uh, tabloids, or not tabloids, excuse me, uh, news agencies that released a, a headline, something to the effect of, you know, bank collapsing and uh, I'm forgetting the nuances, but it was very much pointing to the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 in that first block that actually got confirmed in the Bitcoin blockchain. So whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is as an individual or as a group of people, we still don't know the, the developer that that person uh, is anonymous and has not touched their money since no one's been able to trace it. But since that got released, it was very clear that there was an ideological component of we don't trust these large international global structures because they're clearly not doing what's best for the people. And we want to create a structure that can't be manipulated by those global structures. And back in 2009, 2010, when this was all just starting, I'm sure that seemed pretty ridiculous. Now that Bitcoin is, I didn't actually check today, I think Bitcoin's over, it's still comfortably over a trillion dollar market cap right now, doesn't seem as ridiculous, right? There's still the question of, is it useful in terms of uh, being actual money, right? Are people going to be buying their coffee with Bitcoin? Uh, is Bitcoin the new digital gold, right? There's all these discussions about what kind of asset is Bitcoin, but there's a lot less questioning, is Bitcoin a real asset these days than there was five, 10 years ago when it was like, no, this is a joke of internet money. Um, and actually one of my favorite things that I saw uh, I recently came across this from around 2011, 12, some online group was hosting a competition and they actually said of, you know, first place is $100 and they had all these cash prizes and then fifth place is 10 Bitcoin. 
And, uh, you know, I just laugh to myself now, but yeah, how much that person would be laughing to themselves now, given that 10 Bitcoin is worth more than half a million dollars. And I think the, the number one prize was something like a hundred bucks or $200 or something like that. Uh, and thank you, Michelle, for posting the, the introduction on the history of money. Um, and yeah, and I can try to put together some links later and share with the group. Um, I probably should have prepared that ahead of time and I'll make sure to do that for future sessions. But yeah, I don't, I don't want to uh, be distractedly talking. So I'll, I'll just save any document adding till later on my side. Um, but yeah, so the second side was again with the second innovation was really on the digital money side and experimenting there because the first attempts were with DigiGold. I think that project was started in 82, 83. If I'm remembering correctly, there were a few other attempts through the 90s into the early 2000s. Uh, and interestingly enough, proof of work, which is again is, hey, you wanna potentially uh, add a transaction to a database. You have to run this random computation to get the right to do that. That idea actually did not come out of digital money. That idea actually came out of spam mitigation in the 90s. I'm forgetting the academics who wrote the paper, but they pretty much introduced something akin to proof of work for, uh, for sending emails. That way, uh, for someone who just wants to spend, uh, send, excuse me, a million spam emails, they would actually have to do many, many hours of just their computer running uh, various computations, and it would become uh, not as feasible to actually get to send spam. So that was one proposed a usage of that kind of technology, the later it got adopted into the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, and that was the, the, one of the main is between, I think, uh, what was it, B, B cash, B like the letter B as in boy. Um, I think that came out in 2004, if I'm not misremembering, but there were much more recent attempts as well. And Bitcoin still made some really interesting innovations there. And then the last kind of really broad topic that I want to talk about in terms of overarching innovations of and around Bitcoin is relating to cryptography. And that one is by far the most technically deep, so I'm going to spend the least time on cryptography. Uh, but in a nutshell, cryptography is the art of hiding things in plain sight, right? If anyone here is a history buff uh, and, uh, you know, if you're aware of um, if you're aware of something called the Caesar cipher, which is pretty much you take a word and you move it one or two letters over, you know, you take A becomes C, B becomes D, you know, you move everything over by the same amount of letters. Um, that was kind of one of the original known uh, forms of cryptography. And there were various versions uh, that were done in more of a manual on a paper basis. But then especially once things became digitized in the 20th century, the cryptography also had its own explosion of approaches and post-World War II, there was definitely a lot more experimentation, um, initially all under purview of uh, national agencies of some kind, but thanks to teams at IBM and some of the work that they pushed out, uh, that they, they kind of opened the discussion of is cryptography a public or uh, a government thing. Um, so with the cryptography side, the important yeah, th there's a lot that we can get into there. One important thing to just mention that is relevant here, I, I could get into a little bit of how it works, but I unfortunately feel like that's not gonna be as interesting for the bulk of people. Uh, but there is this idea of public of PKI uh, with public private key infrastructure, uh, or the idea of in Bitcoin, you know, the idea of having an address instead of a username. So if anyone wanted to send me some Bitcoin, and if you do want to, please feel free, uh, you know, I would not send you, you know, my email address of eugene.leventhal at smartcontractresearch.org. I would send you uh, uh, an address that looks like, um, I mean, just to give you an actual sense of what these addresses look like. Um, yeah, whatever, here's a public one that I have. Um, right, so this is a, a wallet address. So if I just sent this to this group, no one has any clue what that's pointing to, whose account that is, right? If you look at the chat, you can see it's 0x7926DAD, which you know, rare that there's an actual word in there, but uh, you, you see that jargony uh, kind of uh, series of letters and numbers, hexacode letters and numbers, right? That's one of my public wallets. But I say that you don't actually know what wallet it is. Is it a Bitcoin wallet? Is it an Ethereum wallet? Is it a Solana wallet? Is it a different wallet? Right. So it's not as though my public address actually discloses my identity, but I don't mind saying like that is my that is a public Ether wallet that I have. Uh, so if you did actually go to Etherscan and drop in the wallet, drop in that wallet address, 
you will see the full history of everything I've done in that wallet, right? So there, there is this mix of pseudo anonymity, where on the one hand, I'm not fully disclosing that, hey, this is Eugene Leventhal doing these things here and there. But and I mean, in this one instance, I, I did buy I, I did get kind of a, a username, so to say, but um, generally speaking, these are the kind of public uh, addresses. And in addition to this public address, which is the bit that I can give out to anyone, the only thing you can really do with it is you could send, you know, if anyone wants to send me some ETH, that's a great address to send it to. Um, but on the flip side, if you wanted to take all of the money in that wallet, you would need my private key. And it's that idea of there's the public key that you could share with everyone. And there's the private key to actually very specifically prove that it's me and get access to things. That was a very important innovation in cryptography that started coming up uh, with some changes in, in the 60s into 70s. I think the actual paper around it was in the 70s, if I'm remembering correctly, around 75 or so. Um, but there, the whole idea was being able to actually uh, yeah, have the split infrastructure so that you could share secrets more widely and create the, the, the kind of infrastructure around it. So again, at a very high level, some of the innovations leading into Bitcoin were around the database side. So how do you get people contributing to a uh, effectively a, uh, a database that is not managed by any set admins? And how do you all agree on the state of truth there? Uh, another aspect was just the architecture of the experiment of digital money and some of the ideology behind Bitcoin. Uh, and the last bit was just the implementations of cryptography and some of the changes that have come up there in recent decades. So I see there were a couple of questions that came up in chat. Uh, what gives a Bitcoin is perceived value short of someone simply willing to buy it. Yeah, and uh, to the, yeah, so uh, to TL, thank you for the question. And Laura, thank you for uh, the, the response, which is always my stock first response of well, what gives the dollar its specific value, what gives the Tesla stock its specific value. None of these things are fundamentally driven anymore. We live in a market society from these perspectives of uh, the market set, right? The, the, the invisible hand, the market, whatever we're referring to there with this theoretical thing is what supposedly is setting the price. Um, and right to Patrick's point, the dollar is backed by the government. So the U.S. says, yeah, well, we have promises to repay. So as long as you trust us as an entity, the dollar has value. And there are, I'm sure everyone here is aware of various, uh, you know, traditional currency uh, crises that have happened internationally, where those governments try saying those same message of like, hey, we're the whatever government and our currency is totally legit because we're legit, but no one actually sees them as a legitimate government. So they actually question what's going on with the currency. So for today, at least we don't have, uh, at least I don't see any major reason to believe the US government is at the brink of collapse and we can no longer trust the dollar or anything like that. But at the same time, Right, there's this idea of, well, the central bank can just decide to print 10 trillion more US dollars and deflate the value of our currency that we all hold as dollars. Or they could decide to do whatever they want to do on the monetary policy side. And we as citizens are not really invited to be part of that process. Uh, right. And that's in kind of a best case scenario, right? The worst case is you fundamentally don't trust your government and they try to control your money supply or things along those lines. So Again, right, why is Bitcoin somewhere in the 60 to $65,000 per Bitcoin range? I don't think anyone in the world can give you a good fundamentals argument as to why it should be specifically in those bands, right? This is something that started as purely a, a fun social digital experiment that somehow kept ballooning. But now, even though there's no government backing Bitcoin, right, what is the equivalent of what the US dollar does for the value of the dollar? what is doing that for the value of Bitcoin? And another way of asking that is, well, who are actually the major stakeholders of Bitcoin? And is Bitcoin a decentralized system, right? Because the whole question of decentralization in, in, in the context of cryptocurrencies is how do we get away from one, 10, a hundred group of, you know, a small group of people that are just going in back rooms and boardrooms and whatever and making all the decisions and no one gets to be part of it. How do we make that a more public process where more individuals can actually be part of the decision-making apparatus? So again, ideologically sounds great. If you look at the reality of Bitcoin, who are the main stakeholders, right? There's no one entity that can just like go change Bitcoin's code. Uh, so for example, right, with Bitcoin, you might've heard that it's a deflationary currency that is capped at tw roughly 21 million Bitcoin. And it said that like, that's backed by Mac. 
And I recently heard someone on a podcast mention, and I, I think this is very accurate, of it's not as though Bitcoin is literally locked into having that amount of currency, right? Theoretically, the stakeholders can come together and adjust the amount. But then the culture around Bitcoin is so strong that the vast majority of Bitcoin holders believe that, hey, if you create a Bitcoin 2.0 with 50 million coins instead of 21 million coins, that's just not Bitcoin. That's already a new thing. And the culture around Bitcoin is so strong that they expect uh, that Bitcoin is the thing that was outlined in 2008 that went live in early 2009. And they are committed to seeing that through to whatever its end is going to be, right? So, and again, the stakeholders here are the miners, the core developers, right? Because at the end of the day, if a change needs to happen, right, code is code. Someone needs to go update some code uh, and uh, the users and potentially regulators. The regulators can be a bit of a complicated one. But theoretically, if the core team of Bitcoin developers just wanted to go and make changes to the Bitcoin code, the, the entire group, sort of the entire ecosystem would just be very upset with them. They would copy all of the code because all of this is open source. They would copy that entire code base that existed just before the change. And they would probably just launch their new currency all over again, committing to the, hey, we're the Bitcoin ho uh, hodlers. Uh, if you ever see H-O-D-L-E-R-S, it's just you know people who are committed to holding uh, you know, minor typo that, that ended up becoming its own meme in the space. Um, so yeah, that, that's, yeah, let me just catch up on some of these questions. Um, yeah, I appreciate the conversation that is happening in terms of the currencies. Yeah. So again, I, I fully recognize, right, that it's much easier, especially for, I imagine for a number of folks here, it's easier to envision that, hey, there's this government, they've been around for a few decades or a few centuries, uh, and we can trust the government, right? But this digital money stuff is still being controlled by a bunch of pseudo anonymous people on the internet where uh, a lot of questionable activity happens. I'm not gonna put as much faith in something like Bitcoin as I would in the dollar. And I totally understand that logic. On the flip side of it though, right, the whole group I've heard people argue it, and I, I kind of honestly have a hard time arguing against it, right? Each cryptocurrency kind of has its own cult form, which can also arguably be said on the national level as well, right? Like deep nationalism stops being logical at a certain point and starts being more cultish. And like, it's hard to define the dividing lines between these things, but same, right? Every startup, every organization, there's the idea of a healthy organizational culture. There's the idea of a super bought in organizational culture. And then somewhere along the lines, especially if there's questionable activity on the other end, you know, that's when things start getting a little cultish. So I, I do think that there is an important cult of cryptocurrencies that needs to be acknowledged and recognized that should Bitcoin based on fundamentals or based on its impact in, on humanity today be worth 60 to 65K? I don't know, probably not. What should it be? I have no clue. Like, if you have a better, if you have a logical way of, of formulaically and scientifically defining value of cryptocurrencies, I'm sure the whole industry would love to hear that. But let me know how that's going with the stock market as well, right? Because last I checked, none of those, you're, again, like Tesla stock is a great one to call out, or Amazon stock is a great one to call out. They really need to be worth what they're worth these days, or just the market saying that, hey, we have faith that given their leaders, given the policy that we have in, uh, we see in place, given the decision-making apparatuses around the two things we just mentioned, we have faith that they're going to keep on a certain trajectory. And this is just applying the same mentality to a different world, right? I get that for folks who are just hearing of this as magic internet money, or especially if uh, you had headlines tainted by the Bitcoin is just drug money or all these things, which are uh, patently false. And I mean, there's some truth to it, but if you actually look at the research, uh, the depth of it is very over-exaggerated in media. Um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's just one of those things that at the end of the day, any large social structure for people to buy into it needs faith. And that's not that I like, I don't love that answer, but I also don't see how this is different than other mass social structures that we're currently dealing with internationally. Just this one, is digital and a lot of it was started by, you know, uh, folks in their late teens, early twenties, which might make it seem more questionable, especially with some of the cultures that come around these cryptocurrencies, but abstract away what's happening. And it does seem very akin to just any large scale social experimentation or new structure building. Um, 
So I see there was the point also about um, money as a medium of exchange or versus investable assets. So, I mean, that's, and there are a bunch of podcasts if you went with economists and whatnot, just digging into unpacking the asset class that Bitcoin or other cryptos can be. Um, but I see also that this is why we've had market bubbles, right? And that's true. Like, I, I, I don't want to diminish the real concerns around this industry and the fact that, uh, you know, there are bubbles and we are probably in one of the bubbles right now that will contract and expand again, just like, you know, again, pick a stock, pick anything that's traded in a market and tell me that it doesn't go through any kind of bubble. Right, even uh, like something like SPY, right, the ETF that uh, that is generally considered one of the safer investments, it's still not a pure linear path. It still has its ups and downs based on overall bubbles and contractions in in the underlying markets. Um, all right, yeah, let me let me try to jump into some more of these. Yeah, and right, and uh, this comment that was made by uh, by June Bum about the I'd like to add the most currencies, most nations' currencies are backed by policies and maintained by a government. Um, and yeah, the big difference is the military, right? So uh, governments and fiat currencies have military power at the end of the day. Here, this is an experiment for what happens where there's you know no one with a gun at the end of the the, the money printer. Um, but I think that first part again does hold true that it's backed by the policies and the individuals and the culture around those things. And I think that at the very least, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, even if they all prove to be a fad and all the specific currencies that are on a site like CoinMarketCap right now, even if they all disappear 10, 20 years from now, I think it's making us collectively rethink and just question some aspects around what does it mean to actually govern assets that are created by governance? And what does it mean for us as individuals to get to be contributors to large scale systems? And especially on the governance side, I do think there's some very interesting experimentation uh, happening there. So uh, there was a question about why I may feel that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies differ from past phenomena, such as the, du the Dutch tulip bulbs. Uh, and yeah, if anyone's unfamiliar with the massive explosion overvaluation and uh, the, 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 that's its own fun history if you want to look into it. Um, and I can only honestly answer that, uh, what was that, Julie, who asked that? Uh, the only honest way I can answer that, Julie, is that there's aspects of it that are exactly mimicking that, right? So for anyone who has heard of Shibu Ina coin, um, yeah, I don't, I don't even want to go too deep into some of these absurd coins, but right, that or Dogecoin was a popular one earlier this year that I felt like I got a, got a lot of news time, right? Like Dogecoin should not be worth anything by any merit or logic at all. Like it was intentionally started as a joke and it was memefied into being a multi-billion dollar thing, right? And Elon Musk even openly said, he's like, the only reason I'm backing Dogecoin is because culture wins. And for whatever reason, people are really enjoying this weird cultural phenomenon. And that's what he wanted to back. I have a lot of thoughts of opinions on that that I won't go into for the moment, but in my mind, all of that is part of what you are very astutely pointing out as just crazed overvaluation. And Shibu Ina is another one of these coins. I think I saw a post today or yesterday. It's up something like 600% this month. They're not, they're not trying to do anything. Like they are literally just riding the wave and these pockets of explosion. And uh, for anyone who's familiar with Discord, uh, which is kind of the Slack for the gaming crypto podcast worlds, like a, f a few uh, industries and subcultures really use Discord as their main messaging platform. I get, I don't know, anywhere from two to 10 invitations to pump and dump uh, servers on Discord every single week, right? Like if you go to Wall Street Bets, the subreddit, you can find, or there is a crypto moonshot bets and there's all these kinds, right? So you can find people who are just playing into the craze, recognizing that, hey, if we just build enough buzz online, right, we can get virality around something that will make me rich. Yeah, let's go, ha let's go create some more bubbles, right? So that I do think is a lot of the negative of the realities of crypto right now. Is this just like, what can we pump and dump just to get more activity? But at the same time, I personally do see a lot of value in experimentations with Bitcoin, with Ethereum, with a few of these major platforms to try to understand how can we actually link money and governance? Uh, because something like a cooperative, right? Co-ops are not new, but if anyone has heard of DAOs, DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations, that's fancy crypto terminology for co-ops in the crypto world. 
And it's taken a while for people working on DAOs for that to even settle in. But once you recognize that, then it's like, all right, well, we're dealing with problems that have been defined for millennia, right? Co-ops are really not new by any stretch of the imagination. But that doesn't mean that the problems have been solved. That doesn't mean that we actually know what it means for cooperative ownership and decision-making to take place between a thousand people distributed all over the planet. That is not something that has a good tried, tested, and proved system. And in my own views of the future of where the economy can head for more of a sustainable future, figuring out how we decentralize is really important. And I, re I realize I mentioned decentralization a few points, so I should define exactly what I mean by decentralization. So from a pure technical architecture standpoint, it literally means uh, do you have things happening in one place or in multiple places is the oversimplified version. I like to think of decentralization as the overall surface area of potential risks and problems for whatever you're doing, right? And the greater the surface area is, the, the harder it is for a single problem to bring the whole thing down. Because if you have a very centralized structure, you have a tiny surface area. And if that tiny surface area has one thing go wrong, your whole system can go kaput, right? If we have a money system and the dictator gets to manage the money and the dictator gets their head chopped off, well, who actually manages the money now? And did everyone just start questioning the money, right? That is the most centralized version of something to be. Fully decentralized would be all of us get equal vote and waiting in a decision, right? Imagine getting, right, forget eight-ish billion on the planet, forget 330-ish million in the country, right? Anytime anyone here who's had to just organize with their friends or with their family and get five to 10 people to agree on a single thing knows how tough that can be. And so the part of cryptocurrencies and blockchain that gets me most excited is the actual experimentations with governance and the tools around governance and how we're making decisions. And one of the research projects that we recently started funding uh, at the Smart Contract Research Forum where I work is looking at how can traditional co-ops and nonprofits learn from all this experimentation that's taking place with DAOs without ever needing a cryptocurrency, right? So for me, it's more the, the part that get, that's really exciting is this large scale experimentation with now upon billions of dollars being invested into the actual research and development of these tools to see what it's like to get an increase in facilitation of coordinated activity between humans. And that is not specific to this industry. And for me personally, that's what is most exciting here. I'm not gonna pretend it's unique here, just I don't know of anywhere else that is investing as much money into the space. So yeah, Julie, just going back to your question, I do feel like there's a lot that is pure bubbles, fakeness, garbage being sold. Um, and some of it is just craze mania, you know, like anytime there's a run of double or triple digit percentage in weeks, right, that's mania, that's not driven by value. So I'm not going to pretend that's not there. But I do think that uh, just like because the craze happened doesn't mean tulips were useless, just because there are these, you know, market crazes happening doesn't mean some of the cryptocurrencies are actually in a position to start providing value to humanity eventually. So there's another question from Brian on how do cryptocurrencies exchange? Nope. How do cryptocurrency exchanges work? Uh, and there's two answers there, centralized or decentralized exchanges. A centralized exchange, think of your E-Trades, your TD Ameritrades, your whatever you do, your traditional equity brokerage through your Robin Hoods, whatever, right? Same exact idea. Uh, they maintain access to your passwords. That way, if you lose something, they can help you reset it. Uh, they keep a fancy Excel sheet that has a record of how much money you have where. And as soon as you want to execute something, you do it through them with the catch being, or I, I don't know about catch or not, but the regulatory requirement being you have to do full AML KYC. You have to do full anti-money laundering, know your customer compliance, which is why when you open an account on anything from Robinhood to any of the others I mentioned, they ask for your driver's license to make sure that you know, you're not doing supposedly questionable activities. Decentralized exchanges, like a place called Uniswap. Uh, so yeah, well, once you go off into magic crypto land, things are grossly unregulated. Um, so theoretically, right, if I want initial amount of cryptocurrency, I either have to go start playing in an ecosystem where I can do some equivalent of mining uh, or earn via proof of stake. Uh, and I, I uh, will see if we end up getting to it. But in a nutshell there, it's, is it a computational based system of how you get to add transactions or is it a monetary game theoretic system of how you get to add transactions? But regardless, um, once you 
unless you want to actually like get super hands-on and earn money within an ecosystem that's generating new value, you can go on Coinbase, you can buy a little bit of Ether. You send that, right? And the money that's in your account on Coinbase technically sits in a wallet. So you could send it from that wallet to any other wallet. MetaMask is a very popular one for the Ethereum ecosystem. So once you send your money from your centralized wallet to something like MetaMask, from there, you can hook that thing up to Uniswap, which is a decentralized exchange, and you can get access to whatever you want <laughs> because the centralized exchanges still do some level of oversight and double checking of the products that they're listing. There is zero, well, I, I'm not calling out Uniswap specifically, but there are especially some decentralized exchanges that have zero barriers to entry for listing something. So I know, for example, uh, one of my friends is teaching a course at Wharton soon, and he's going to create a fake Wharton coin just to get to show, like give students a chance to interact with it in class. And he's actually going to put it up on a decentralized exchange, right? So there's zero checks in place for that. Um, so yeah, if anyone does want to actually uh, play around with that world, uh, it starts getting much scarier because the UI UX is worse. There's no password management. You know, you lose your keys and forget your logins and didn't save your seed phrase, then you're locked out of your money. There's a lot of other issues there. But the second half of your question, Brian, was are you buying coins that are owned by a fund or a company? So if I'm not mistaken, the way that Coinbase does it is I do think they actually buy up a massive amount of cryptocurrency. So I do believe in a centralized exchange, they will actually to facilitate the liquidity of it, they will make massive purchases of crypto, and they will be the 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 they can even be the counterparty. So they're not necessarily just facilitating so that I can buy, you know, let's say I want to buy some ETH, I don't need to buy it off someone who holds ETH, I can buy it off of Coinbase's uh, repository of Ether. Um, whereas if you use a decentralized exchange, there are some now that are creating you know, market makers as they've been seen in traditional financial markets. But for the most part, a decentralized exchange, uh, to my knowledge, is more of a one-to-one -one of, if I'm buying, that means I'm buying it from someone who is selling. Uh, so that is much more of a, a direct individual one. And yeah, I guess I should have seen that Laura already jumped in on that one. All right, yeah, I am very behind because there have been a lot of questions that have come up. So apologies for Hi. falling behind. Yeah, please. I thought How are you? Coming. Someone coming, trying to come in on mic. Good, how are you doing? What's uh, What question is on your mind? All right, so I will jump back to uh, so what is my perspective on Bitcoin mining as supply? Um, that's an interesting one. I mean, I guess part of the logic of Bitcoin mining is that uh, and why there's the having, why there's the having. So uh, if you mine Bitcoin, like I mentioned in the early days, it was 50, then it became 25, then 12 and a half. And th that's kind of the reward for each block that gets mined. Um, so on that side... The whole logic there is that the graph of the actual reward of Bitcoin over time goes down, right? Because it's going to keep getting cut in half every four years. At the same time, if the system becomes more widely I'm adopted. Watching. CMU alumni did like a program. Sorry, I'm going to go ahead and mute someone because I can hear you. Um, but yeah, there's on the other side. Um, with the Bitcoin mining, uh, so yeah, one aspect of, uh, of the Bitcoin mining is, like I mentioned, the actual amount that you're getting. The other aspect is the optional transaction that a person who's uh, sending a transaction, they can add some Bitcoin to their transaction. And pretty much what that says is like, hey, if I want a free transaction, I don't have to put any money in. But if I want it to be super priority and top of the list and that to guarantee that it is one of the first transactions that gets added, then I can add some more money to that. So the logic is as the actual Bitcoin fees go down, the transaction fees will go up. Um, honestly, I have not delved too much into the economics from the, the historic perspective, just in terms of the exact equivalence or not to gold mining and, and whatnot. But the whole point with Bitcoin is that it's deflationary. It is a limited asset. No one's going to create new Bitcoins. So there are some, uh, some uh, kind of semblances you can draw there. At the same time, we can 
excuse me, find new gold reserves or oil reserves or whatever asset that is supposedly, or that is limited, just we might not know all of the limited supply. So there's that caveat as well. Uh, but yeah, happy to add any more clarity, any, any more questions, if there are any other thoughts there. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I saw someone else commented in response to the previous question with the tulips, you know, if Bitcoin or other currencies can prove to be real currencies and not just an asset, I think that's a great point and still an open question. Uh, I am unconvinced that I will ever buy anything with Bitcoin, you know, in real life. Uh, whereas with other cryptos, they've already become easy enough to interact where I needed to, to, you know, use that crypto to get into an event or do something like that. So I think which cryptos are trying to be a reserve asset, uh, just another asset for trading, uh, which are trying to, uh, to more be actual currency and, and implemented and used day to day. I think all of that is still very much to be seen. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the point of this time is different. Of course, that's what everyone who has their head down in an area thinks is, yeah, yeah, yeah I know of all the other problems, but we're going to do it right this time. And I'm obviously unconvinced of that, but I'm excited to see, especially at this point, the maturity of the industry where there's a lot more, uh, well, just being blunt, there's a lot more adults in the room than there were five, six years ago and saying of like, hey, you know that whole thing you think you just invented? There's literally a hundred years of knowledge in that direction. And this is the topic and like, go read these papers. And there's a lot more of that kind of learning happening now than there was five, six years ago. So hopefully there will at least be, right? We will all just be adding to whatever the future state of knowledge will be. Um, what other hacking? Oh, what other backing besides the intense mining hardware needs? Fun? What other backing besides the mining, the hardware and the community? So I would actually say that, right? The, the, the hardware is just a result of how the architecture played out. Um, theoretically, all of that, well, I guess not all of it can be repurposed because there's literally machines that do nothing but a certain type of computation. So if that computation got changed, then that's just a waste of massive amount of hardware. Um, but in general with Bitcoin, as it was kind of mentioned there, the, uh, the main thing that came up was um, in terms of stakeholders, again, were, were the miners, the developers, uh, and the users. And so I'm still unconvinced that Bitcoin is truly decentralized, right? If you look at miners and how concentrated that is, uh, it's still unclear. So I do think that Bitcoin and a lot of cryptos are more driven by the prospect of future usage and impact as opposed to actually being covered right now. Um, yeah, so there was also a point brought up about mining and energy. So yes, so with proof of work, given that is linked to a, a type of computation, it is energy intensive. People who are hardcore advocates uh, of Bitcoin will say that is a reasonable price to pay to have a financial infrastructure that is not uh, linked to any country. Um, I, time, only time will tell if that is a factual point and if there's an actual uh, use for this or not, or, and, and you know whether or not this, this kind of proves to, to um, yeah, have been a questionable usage of natural resources, right? But at the same time, like, I don't know if anyone is, and again, not trying to, to not address this issue because it is a valid one and it is a concern, but on the flip side, you know, has anyone looked into the energy usage of the full banking system? That takes a lot, but it, it, it's contributing a lot more to humanity, right? Let's take AI as an example. Are you aware of how much electricity uh, like Google alone is using and training all of their AI models? It's pretty absurd amount relative to what I at least initially thought it was. So I think with any new technology, there is always this questionable resource usage and it only becomes proven to be useful with time, assuming the tool ended up being useful, right? If, you know, Betamax ended up using uh, kilowatts and gigawatts of energy and all these things, uh, we probably would have said that was not a great usage of energy, but if, you know, whatever amount ended up being used to create the innovations of whatever we are using today, we don't question as much because we see those things as useful. So again, not really trying to deflect, just that's a really hard philosophical question of, you know, if you see a, a, a natural resource depletion as part of creating something, at what point do you decide that it is no longer worth creating that thing? And I, I don't know how to answer that one. That, that's just a very tough one. Um, yes, legitimacy. So there is a great article that Vitalik Buterin wrote about legitimacy. And for anyone 
who likes podcasts, you should check out Going Deep with Noah Feldman. He had Vitalik on and they just got into legitimacy. And Noah Feldman is a Harvard uh, lawyer slash professor on constitutional law. And they just dug into legitimacy. So questions of legitimacy, reputation, trust, uh, all of these things really come together in governance. And what does this mean? Uh, so yeah, that, that's very exciting. Uh, Julie, to your point of Bitcoin and market manipulation, spot on. There's a whole, there's more research coming out about how the underlying derivatives markets might actually be causing massive fluctuations that, you know, 2% of people are aware of and they're just riding all that money. Um, yeah, thank you, Daniel, for mentioning the, uh, the Vitalik piece that, that was mentioned. I heard that there is now an ETF for Bitcoin. So I forgot if it actually launched or if it got announced, but yes, supposedly there's a Bitcoin ETF. I don't get it, to be perfectly blunt. ETF, right, S and SPY, what is that? You take 500 stocks, you have an ETF that is linked to those 500 stocks, so you get a basket of things. Why do you have a basket of one? I, I, I must be missing something because I, I just don't get what they're doing there. A cryptocurrency ETF makes more sense to me because then you're at least invested across multiple assets. I don't get what a one-to-one -one ETF to asset is. Did you comment on the adoption? So yeah, the coin in El Salvador, that's a fun question. Thank you for that one, Alejandra. Um, I have mixed opinions and I will caveat it with, I have not been keeping in touch closely enough to really understand the on the ground cultural implications of what's happening there. So I don't just wanna, I mean, I, I will inevitably only speak as an outside observer with very limited knowledge. Um, on the one hand, I think it's super cool that some governments are recognizing it as currency. I think that if there are ways that it can be done to actually help the citizens of that country, I am super into it. If someone is doing this to get brownie points internationally, and I'm not saying that the president of El Salvador is, again, I don't know the details to comment one way or another, but if they're doing this just to get publicity, and it's not really going to help their citizens, you know, however much Bitcoin they bought for all their citizens, that money probably could have been spent better in a different way. On the other hand, if this is really being built out with the intention of facilitating some kind of value exchange for El Salvadorians, and it's going to be impactful in five, 10 years, and this is just the uncomfortable learning period, that, that could also be a version. I just don't, again, I, I don't want to misspeak. So I, I am not blindly optimistic on it. I'm also not blindly pessimistic on it. Right. I'm just going to jump to the bottom because, um, yeah, because I missed a bunch of comments. Um, so yeah, there will be a record. There will be a link for this recording. Who who pays the cost for the energy? Who pays for the cost for the hardware? It's always the miner. So you could technically mine off your computer. You'll have almost a zero probability chance of winning. If you create a manufacturing, you know, industrial scale mining rig, uh, you have to pay for that. Governments do sometimes subsidize energy, which can be its own complicated thing. I think Wyoming. Um, Wyoming has some, like, if you outfit old energy facilities, like you get a cut on your energy rate. So I see we're about hitting a time. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to get to all the questions. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the amount of enthusiasm and interaction that came in. Hopefully this was actually helpful. Uh, I, I like to think of myself someone who is very bullish, but with, with a bit of cynicism and criticism as well. Uh, so yeah, I, I did not want to just sing, sing its praises and hopefully gave you a sense of some of the honest criticisms as well. But yeah, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, I will drop my email uh, in here and you can always get connected to me through uh, other folks at, uh, at Heinz. But yeah, thank you all for, for taking the time to join today. It was great chatting with you all and I hope this was useful. Yeah, Eugene, if you drop my email, feel free to reach Eugene, out. thanks so much. We appreciate you being here. I know we're, we're all coming with different levels of knowledge of crypto. I think you did a fantastic job in handling it all. And uh, be on the lookout, everybody. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Be on the lookout for a follow-up email with the video. Eugene has agreed to include his email in that. So if there are questions that you think of after or if he didn't get to today, you can reach out to him via his email. I do want to make a plug for our alumni LinkedIn group. If you're not already a member, please join our alumni LinkedIn group that already has 8,000 plus alums. We'll put that link in our follow-up email as well. And uh, we're going to continue to have these virtual sessions, but we hope to, to welcome you all back to campus in person soon. So farewell, everybody. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks Ron. Thanks, everyone.